oh, after the ugly man is poor Superman. Mm -hmm. And at that point, when I start writing that, it's about 92, my uh, partner of three or four years who is straight, mm -hmm. but not while we're together, uh, we have broken up and he's marrying a woman. Mm -hmm. And I'm dealing with, you know, how do I really feel about being gay? How do I, you know, because I, I, I the, th the other thing I did is I didn't go to gay theaters and say, do my work. I went to straight theaters and said, do my work. There weren't that many gay theaters to begin with, but even so, I didn't want to be ghettoized. I didn't want to have to be in the gay thing. And so it was really important to me that people like Paul Thompson or Jerry Potter or John Cooper, you know, these straight guys who were running theaters, understand where I'm coming from mm -hmm. and give me the same opportunity they're giving their white straight friends, mm -hmm. which thankfully they did and, and they understood that, you know. But by, by 92, 93, when I'm writing Poor Superman, uh, everybody is dying. Mm -hmm. Like literally my circle of friends, of partners, of, of men that I've known for 10 or 15 years now that I came out with are disappearing one by one. They're all dying horrible, horrible deaths while the rest of the world carries on and not only doesn't care, but a big part of it actually celebrates the fact that these gay men are dying of this horrible disease. Mm -hmm. And that really upsets me. It really upsets me and I want to write a play about it and I want to write a play about sexuality and I want to write a play about gender and how uh, uh, elastic it can be and also sexuality and how elastic it can be and how question, uh, words like straight and gay and bi are kind of stupid. I mean, you know, everything is contextual. Everything is about who you're with, where you are, what's happening at the time. So I wrote this play about a, a successful painter who um, is feeling really out of touch with his muse and the work is shit, so he gets a job as a waiter at a restaurant run by a young couple and he and the husband fall in love. In the meantime, the waiter's best friend, who's a transsexual, is HIV positive and dying while she's trying to have her sex change completed as well. And it was right when that whole death of Superman thing happened as mm -hmm. well. Do you, I don't know if you remember that, but it was a huge deal in the early 90s when we killed Superman for the first time. I got to quit doing that. This, <laughs> this thing. But it's true. <laughs> um, and I thought, you know, for me, as a comic collector, that was a really profound thing. As a Superman fan, it was a really a profound moment mm -hmm. that they were going to kill this guy and reinvent him because basically what they were doing was killing my childhood. The, the Silver Age Superman mm -hmm. and the Silver Age DC Universe was being wiped out. And I thought, well, that's really interesting because my gay universe is being wiped out at the same time. So how do those things mesh? How do they correspond? And what are the, uh, what are the, the semiotics and the semantics that we share in all of those worlds? And how can, they, how can they overlap? And so it became a play with captions where we literally uh, projected captions on the stage or on the characters or whatever to indicate many different things, but usually their internal thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that was a comic book device, but I also thought, um, if you do that, if you ask the audience to read, how does that affect their engagement with the play? Do they get more into it because they're more active, because they're reading? So it was that kind of thing mm -hmm. that I was playing with at the time. And we, I remember we had a, um, one of the first readings, I'd moved back, to, moved to Toronto, back to Toronto. And I was at Cannes Stage, I was working with Iris and uh, Candy Burley and Bob Baker who were there at the time and they all really liked the play. And so they were doing it in a, we we're doing a reading of it downstairs at Berkeley. You know that space and, and you know, mm -hmm. it's a big wonderful brick wall space and the actors were all on the stage. And we're all sitting there watching and we get to the part where um, the transsexual character is visited by the ghost of her dead lover. And all of a sudden this black crack on the back wall appears and it starts to open up and it's getting wider and everyone's looking around like, what's going on here? We, have no, we don't know what this thing is. There are these barn doors at the back of the theater that are always locked and Candy went running up and grabbed them and pulled them closed and locked them and said, I don't know how that happened, I'm so sorry. And, and everyone said, that those doors are locked. They're always locked. And somehow at that point when we were reading the play, they opened up and I felt like, the spirit of every person I knew who died of AIDS came for that reading. Mm -hmm. That they, had, they found a way into the theater to be part of that. It was one of the most powerful moments ever in my life. And it uh, had a, uh, from what I heard, it was a very interesting rehearsal process. How did you, uh, 
uh, what was your relationship like with the actors and with the process of rehearsing it? And I, Again, I didn't really have much of a process because okay. Derek Goldby directed that production. I directed it in Edmonton okay. at uh, Theatre Network uh -huh. the year before with Chris Peterson, uh, the female impersonator playing uh, the trans person mm -hmm. and Kent Staines and a number of Edmonton actors. And what I thought was a really good production, we got mm -hmm. along fine. I was Derek fine. though to work with. Was Derek was okay? Derek Goldby? Yeah. Derek Goldby is a nightmare. Every, anyone who's worked with Derek Goldby will tell you he is a nightmare. He directed um, Remains in New York okay. at, the, uh, at the Orpheum for the off-Broadway production. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got along very well, but he is a misogynistic, homophobic, hateful man. I mean, he really doesn't like anyone, despite being homosexual himself <laughs> and all of that. He, he really is a, a difficult personality, and, and I, I, we got along fine during, um, during Remains. But with poor Superman, when he was asked to direct it in Toronto and in Winnipeg, he hated the captions. Mm -hmm. He hated the captions and he contractually had to use them. And I wasn't going to let him off the hook and not use them. Mm -hmm. So what he did was he turned the lights up so bright that no one could ever see the captions when they were being projected. Never told me this until opening night. So I got there opening night, saw it and had a fit. My agent had an even bigger fit. And uh, everybody got called out, and the lights got turned down, and the captions got put back in, and Derek and I never spoke again. As for the actors, I didn't really have much, uh, much truck with them. Again, some of them were the same, like Kent Staines and Chris Peterson were in the show, who had been in my show, and Julie Stewart, who's wonderful and everything, was in the show, mm -hmm. Jason Cadu. Great. Um, but I, I, except to say, you know, good show, mm -hmm. loved it. Didn't really it was have very much, successful. Yeah, I didn't have very much to do with them at all. But the production was successful. Oh, very successful. Ran yeah. for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah.